So as I said, this morning we're continuing in our series from 1 Thessalonians. Um, and the title that Peter will be sharing on will be uh, is, is on sharing the gospel or sharing the good news of Jesus. And one of the verses we will hear read, hear read says, Because we, that is Paul and Silas, loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And if you remember last week, we, we saw how the, Thessalonic, the church in Thessalonica was a witness uh, to people all over the world almost, that, that their, uh, the way that they were living, the way that they were uh, serving God was a witness to everyone. So this, this idea of, of kind of who we are um, actually speaking out words of the gospel uh, just by who we are. So, so this is Darren. He's a bit skinny. He needs more biscuits. Um, or maybe he's Daphne. I don't know. Uh, you can decide. He's a believer or she's a believer in Jesus. They work with a lot of non-believers. Many of his friends are non-believers. Many of the people that he plays football with or netball with or pool with or socialise in other ways are non-believers. And lots of their family don't believe in Jesus either. So what I'm asking is, how do you think Darren could share his life, share who he is, in such a way that others might begin to wonder a bit more about who Jesus is and whether he is worth finding out about? What is it about Darren or Daphne that would speak of the Lord Jesus in the way that they behave, the, the things that they do, the way that they are. If you could call out some things, and Peter is going to write them down for me. John. You have to live it first, and if necessary, speak. Right, so what does living it look like? Care for the environment, like Andy's just talking about. Caring for the environment. Or creation. Excellent, and creation, caring for creation. Just Showing the quality integrity. of your own life. Showing integrity. <coughs> the, quality of your own the quality of your own life. Being, being kind to people. Being kind to people. John's always very kind, I think. Any other ways? Being a Being non judgmental. Non judgmental. Serving. You can call out, you don't have to put your hands up. I know I used to be a teacher, but that was years <laughs> ago. <laughs> Not holding a grudge. Showing the attitude of Christ. The attitude of Christ. Forgiving. 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 Good listener. Good listener. A good listener. <laughs> <laughs> a good listener. <laughs> oh dear, 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 dear. This is something Generous. else. Generous. Generous. Avoiding gossip. Avoiding gossip. Charitable. Charitable. Any other way? Who would his mate when he's playing football or her friends when she's, I don't know, sat in the pub with them? How would they see something of Jesus? <laughs> Use of language. Use of language. So I saw some, some embarrassed faces there. <laughs> Any others? Being interested, interesting or interested? Interested. <laughs> Being interested in other people, the people that you're with. Honesty. Honesty. Putting other people before yourself. Putting other people before yourself. Forgiving. Forgiving, I think. Compassionate. Compassionate. Attitude of gratitude. An attitude of gratitude. Accepting. Accepting. Active in the community. Active in the community. So that's very much a looking outwards thing, isn't it? Proactive. Proactive. Not having prejudice. Not having prejudice. Don't judge. Don't judge. Showing anger, appropriate anger. Appropriate anger. So is that sort of thinking in terms of justice? 
rather than at things, being angry about things that affect yourself necessarily, but actually it's okay to be angry about injustice. Okay? I've got one more. You can just being, being able to make good cake. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Do you want to give it to us then, Jason? Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to make a difference. Great. Great, well done. Okay. Do you want to give it to us? Perseverance, yeah. Perseverance. <laughs> I mean, we've got a fairly um, comprehensive list there, really. And so I just want a, a moment or two to reflect on the last time you were socially or, or at work or, you know, with people who are not, um, not Christians, people who uh, don't know Jesus. Kind of how were you able or were you able, did you? communicate something of who Jesus is through the way that you interacted or if you didn't are there things that you could do differently next time perhaps that you're in a, a group of people how could people see Jesus in us our reading this morning is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 you know brothers and sisters that our visit to you was not without results we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though, as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This is the word of the Lord. So who, who would be an apostle? Within a few months of arriving in Europe for the first time, Paul and his companions have been imprisoned in Philippi. They've been smuggled ignominiously out of Thessalonica. They've been escorted to safety out of Berea and down to Athens. And now here Paul is in Corinth, waiting anxiously for news of the church in Thessalonica. Have the Thessalonian church stayed true to their new faith in Jesus? Have they succumbed to the pressure to conform to the ways of the people around them? And then, of course, the news comes via Timothy. The Thessalonians are doing well. Paul has reason to be thankful for them, as we saw last week. Not only are they continuing in their faith, but 
the news of their faith is spreading beyond Greece even in, into the, the church throughout the world. But there is a fly in the ointment. If we read the next couple of chapters of Thessalonians, it seems that there were criticisms of Paul. They're not written down there explicitly, but, but it's implied by what you read in the next two chapters. And those criticisms weren't necessarily expressed by the Thessalonian church themselves, but by those who opposed Paul while he was there. And, and they probably went something like this. He didn't last long, did he? Just another rabbi with his own particular take on religion, just like the rest of them, on the make, burnishing his own reputation, hooking you into some unsustainable beliefs, probably taking a few favours from the locals on the way. You know how these preachers assert their power over people. And so Paul needs to answer these criticisms to reassure his new congregation. Don't believe those lies. As he does this, he appeals to their memory of his short time with them. You know, he writes four times in the passage, you remember, you are our witnesses. So that's what this passage is, basically. Paul having to defend his ministry to the Thessalonian church. But the bonus is, as he does so, we get an amazing insight a, a, a template, if you like, ground rules for sharing the gospel. The template, is, the template isn't so much for the content of the message that he preaches. It's more for the attitude, the way of life, and the behavior of a servant of the gospel. So let's see what we can learn from Paul's very personal template this morning. And we're going to look at three things that Paul was, three good roles that he played, and five things that he wasn't, five bad roles that he avoided. So let's start with what Paul wasn't. Firstly, Paul wasn't just another traveling rabbi. He had the truth. The appeal we make does not spring from error, he wrote in verse 3. His gospel was true. Now, we don't know exactly what, it said, what he said, but it's safe to assume that it was the same gospel that he was preaching in Corinth at the, the, at the actual time of writing to the Thessalonians only a few months, months later. It's very simple and direct. In 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, we read these words. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now the implications and the application of that message for the individual may require some unpacking, but that historical sequence of events is at the heart of the good news. It was a new story, it was a strange story, but it was true, it was without error. Secondly, Paul wasn't an angler. What do I mean by that? Well, the word translated to trick in verse 4 originally meant the catching of fish by means of bait. In other words, dangling a juicy worm for a fish only to ensnare it or trap it on a hook. Our gospel is to be presented in an open and honest way. We do not ensnare or trap by de deception. For example, there is a cost to following Jesus. We should be open and honest about it. Thirdly, Paul wasn't a salesman. Actually, I think selling is an honorable profession, but I have in mind the kind of salesman that inveigles his way into people's good books with flattery and then tries to make as much money as he can in exchange for the minimum of goods and services. Our gospel is not offered as a transaction, but freely because we love the people we are sharing it with. Fourthly, Paul wasn't a people pleaser, and that's very clear from the fact that as he preached the gospel, it landed him in jail, or it led him to flee for his life. It's good to be sensitive to people's pain 
and discomfort and their concerns. But the danger of being a people pleaser is that we alter our gospel to make it more palatable to our listeners. We skirt around the holiness of God and the nature of sin, for example. And fifthly, Paul was not an authoritarian. As people responded to the gospel and found a new power and a new purpose in their lives, it would have been natural to hold the bringer of that good news in high esteem, i.e. Paul. And perhaps that esteem would only be increased as they came to understand the special place that Paul had within the worldwide church as an apostle, one appointed directly by the Lord Jesus. In no way did Paul use his position to his advantage, either by placing financial burdens on the people of Thessalonica or by ordering them around to his advantage. It's been distressing in recent years, hasn't it, to hear of many cases of high-profile and widely admired Christian leaders overreaching their positions to abuse members of their flocks. That, of course, is not the gospel way. So, I've suggested some things that Paul wasn't, some roles that he chose not to play. Now, we turn to what Paul actually was. And I've just three of these. And he talks about himself as a steward, as a mother, and as a father. So let's look at each of these in turn. Firstly, Paul as a steward. The passage doesn't actually use the word um, steward, but the idea comes from verse 4, which says... We speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 exhorts us, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Paul has been given the grace of sharing the gospel and he's using it to serve the Thessalonians. So this idea of stewardship fits very well with the passage. As a good steward, Paul's heart is bent on pleasing God first, not men. And we also read that God tests the heart. God knows that Paul is going to avoid the pitfalls that I listed earlier. He will preach a gospel free from error. He will share it with openness and honesty. He will share it freely. It won't be distorted by people-pleasing, nor will Paul abuse his position to exploit the gospel for selfish gain. In other words, the gospel is safe in his hands. It's worth pointing out at this point that when we call what Paul did as sharing the gospel, it went beyond just the proclamation of a message. It went beyond the proclamation to the establishment of the gospel in their lives so that the Thessalonians began to live out the truth and the implications of the gospel. And that fits with the second and third roles of Paul as, his, as a mother and as a father to the Thessalonians. So Paul as mother. The picture here is intimate and beautiful. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. That's verses 7 and 8. Paul is describing an intimate family relationship here. The mother longs to feed and protect her children. Paul longed to feed his flock with God's word. And he longed to protect them as well, which is perhaps the reason why he left Thessalonica. He, he allowed himself to be smuggled out of the, of the town after some of the Jews stirred up trouble against him. As he leaves Thessalonica, he's seeking to protect the new church from further danger. The passage goes on with the verse that Bobby used earlier. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, but our lives as well. Well, of course, the Thessalonian church was like a child to Paul. A child is part of the family, and sharing lives is what families do. While he was in Thessalonica, from the account in Acts, we see that Paul and Silas stayed with Jason, and Jason and his family would have had ringside seats on their lives. 
he would have seen them working hard to make sure that they weren't a financial burden on the Thessalonians, as you see in verse 9. And he would have seen the integrity of their lives, their actions matching their words in um, verse 10. I'm sure Paul would have um, displayed many of these virtues um, listed here. And I wonder if living in that sort of pagan society that's not had the Christian influence that we have, I wonder whether his behavior would have had even more impact on those around him. Then finally, we have Paul as father, in verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. In the Greek and Roman world of that time, the father would have been responsible for teaching and training his children. Here, Paul describes himself as reminding the Thessalonians of their calling into God's kingdom and ultimately into their, the participation with God in his glory. And as a result, he's motivating them to live lives worthy of God. He wants to point them in the right direction. So what does all this mean for us? I suspect that not many of us think of ourselves as apostles or evangelists or even paid ministers of the gospel. I couldn't put myself in any of those categories. The danger is we might therefore conclude that actually this isn't relevant to us. Yet surely most of us who believe in Jesus Christ have some personal experience of the gospel. We know why we believed in the first place. We know why we continue to believe. We know what we have experienced of God's goodness. We are at least stewards of this gospel experience. We do therefore have something to share and we, like Paul, can share it truthfully, with openness and honesty, freely and seeking to please God before we please people as we do so. We, like mothers, can find many ways of caring for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can still contribute to feeding one another as we share our own experience of God working in our lives and what we're actually learning from him. We can still be like Paul, seeking to live out our lives with integrity so that our lives match our words. And we still, like fathers, can help others along the way, speaking of our own calling into God's kingdom and our hopes for future glory, encouraging others to keep going on that journey. While I was at university, I'd come to faith through a series of evangelistic Bible studies at a hall of residence. And one of the guys who led the Bible study suggested that a few of us got together once a week, early in the morning before lectures, to read our Bibles and pray together. It was a very simple act. Usually this guy, Matt, would select a fairly random story from one of the more narrative sections of the Old Testament, but it was fun to get together and see what insights we could mine out of what we'd read. What we shared was not particularly profound or insightful, but it introduced me to a habit of daily personal Bible reading and prayer as a way of meeting with God. And that's something I've taken with me into the rest of my life. Sometimes it doesn't really take much. We need our apostles our evangelists, our teachers, and our prophets, and our vicars, but we can all encourage others along the way. Amen.